What is up, guys? Welcome back to Meeting Enough Podcast. I'm Andres. It is RB3. And joining us today, we have the author, video essayist, Hugu Award finalist, Lindsay Ellis. What is up? How are you doing, Lindsay? Good. Working on that, actually, actually netting a Hugo <laughs> to the long term goal. Yeah, no, I swear, just making the finals for that is just, I know, I'm assuming a lot of people have told you that, but that really is a major deal. Yeah, it was, uh, I mean, it, it was actually, you know, it was, it was pretty surprising since it's like, we weren't the first YouTubers ever nominated, but we were the first in like a video essay category. The second yeah. YouTuber nominated. The first was Rachel Bloom, who would go mm. on to create Crazy Ex-Girlfriend and yes. be super famous. <laughs> no, it really is incredible. And you're a debut author now with Axiom Zen. I actually have a copy myself. So I get to show off the really cool cover of it uh, for anyone who's watching on YouTube. Uh, but again, guys, it's an excellent read. Uh, I finished it a couple days ago. Debut novel. Uh, I, I guess that's my first question. How does that feel to have your debut, debut novel out in stores right now? Sucks. Couldn't have happened in a worse year. <laughs> That's <laughs> kind of a good point. Yeah. Fucking blows, man. Yeah. I was like, this was the year I like, constructed my year over like all the travel I was going to do. I was going to have a book tour, uh, yeah. you know, and uh, I, I, you know, I was, I, I was going to be a really busy year. And now like, it's just, I don't leave my house most days and I haven't seen people in many months. And it's, you know, it, it's weird to have your relationship to the release of your book like happen completely online and you know mm. you know so many of your interactions being on like over twitter uh so it's like it it, it i mean i guess it's it's nice that it like you know hit the times list but like mm. the the actual experience is like i you know i, I kind of feel a little robbed <laughs> because everyone's like wow you only get to debut once and i'm like mm-hmm uh, <laughs> <Sure do. laughs> that's a good point that's very true i mean when i walked into my my local barnes and nobles I mean, that if it feels like it's kind of like a safe, like six feet away, everyone's mm -hmm. social distancing, mask is required at every store that I've been at. Um, and it always seems like the cool place to be at during a quarantine yeah. uh, to pick yourself up a good book. But obviously, if you guys haven't done so, go do that all. Um, uh, literally pretty much in every bookstore you can find, at least from what I've looked at. So uh, that's incredible already. So congrats on that. Honestly, Lindsay, that's amazing. Thank you. Um, RB3, you had a question about uh, YouTube. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I just wanted to jump in. Like like uh, Andrea said, like we are, I've been a huge fan. We've both been huge fans of you for a long, long time. Oh, um, and yeah, and you know, you've got your start, obviously in online criticism, specifically like centered on YouTube. Do you feel like there's uh, been a benefit to kind of uh, uh, demo de uh, democratizing the title of online uh, film critic for the internet. Like, how, what, what, what do you, what do you feel about that? Um, I have mixed feelings on it, to be honest. Uh, mm -hmm. I feel like people mistake confidence for uh, being good at a thing, and they're, you know, sort of like we've had a lot of discussions on like the Dunning Kruger effect, um, like in politics. But I think that's also true of online criticism. Like, there will be these people that like perform the affect of knowing what they're talking about. And if they confirm to some people's bias, <laughs> um, that can be all they need to do in order to amass really big followings. And um, that can, and actually as I was tweeting about this today, is like, you know, uh, like I have mixed feelings about my own history, like in the early shouty man days of online criticism, because I feel like I've kind of inadvertently contributed to this sort of really toxic media criticism environment um where there's just like a lot of bad faith like ben shapiro style nitpicking like <laughs> to, you know taking the text really literally in a way that kind of leaks into you know the movies that get made like I, I think i talked a little bit about that like the beauty and the beast video about how like the creators of westworld like uh, saw a reddit thread that guessed a uh, plot twist and so they changed the the no, I think that was in Game of... Well, it was like a video I did uh, about how like, you know, creators are responding to fan interactions and like how Disney movies will almost kind of make, um, you know, their films with like these sort of bad faith criticisms in mind. And so they kind of lose their magic in that way. So, but, uh, you know, on the other hand, it's like, uh, you can't say there was no like snobbery back when film criticism was kind of restricted to like, you know, 
the Chicago Sun Times and the New Yorker. So, um, you know, it is kind of a double edged sword because I think it really, you know, the sort of taking this thing and turning it into a corporate model has uh, made it like, uh, you know, it's, it, it incentivizes people from a business standpoint to make criticism that is sometimes extremely bad faith and bad. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <Wet-ass> P word. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a good example for sure. <laughs> but, but it's also the idea of your, one of your most recent videos, uh, Titanic is good actually, mm-hmm. where you talk about uh, reframing something to a positive angle versus making it a very negative angle for it's a YouTube al- algorithm yeah. is rewarding uh, the negative aspect of a film. Uh, yeah, which absolutely. Leads to like, you know, I can say their name, CinemaSins, mm-hmm. but it leads to those kind of channels of just being the nitpicky channels where that's supposedly film criticism. And that's the, the first film criticism that a young person sees. Yeah, that, that's definitely the case for a lot of people. Yeah, because I'm looking at uh, my channel right now. That Titanic video hasn't even hit a million views yet. Oh, really? Um, I think yeah, it's so great. It's, yeah, it, but it's, it just kind of goes to show that, like, uh, it, it is hard to, you know, because we've been trying to trend away from that. Like, I think uh, I, I did, like, the Game of Thrones ones I did last year were the, mm. the last ones that were like, this thing sucks. Yes. <laughs> and I, although I do still stand by that because I'm still mad about that. Yeah. <laughs> I, was on a, I was on a Game of Thrones podcast. Shout out to Casterly Talk. Uh, and I mentioned your video and how how like you're really good at nailing certain points in the story that were just kind of out there, especially in the last season. Mm-hmm. Uh, big old yikes. Um, but yeah, that really, it, it was a question I had because I really do feel like film criticism now has become this different ideology as far as what people think it is and what it actually is. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do you feel like there's still a a way to go? Do do people still need that publication to be considered a film critic? Um, I don't know. I I think it's become less about, like companies have increasingly valued like rating systems, like Rotten Tomatoes, Mm -hmm. more than like the validation of like some old guy like A.O. Scott. Mm. Um, so, you know, but, and, and I think the, uh, the other weird thing is that like five years ago, I was like just considered the dregs. Uh, and now, you know, sort of the converse is that like, you know, what is effectively self-published film writing has some legitimacy now in a way that it definitely did not five years ago. Um, so uh, yeah, it, 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 it is interesting how it's shifting um uh not always in a good way but definitely in a way that like allows for opportunity but like i guess again the flip side of that is youtube is becoming harder and harder to break into for new Mm. people like because Mm. the algorithm is acting against you until you have a big hit and so basically it's like i think the barrier for entry paradoxically is higher now than it was five years ago just because of the way algorithms work um like like as a for instance i had a friend who uh Hit, like he had like 10 fall or he he, he does a podcast with me uh musical explaining it's about musicals and he had like 10 followers yep. um on twitter like six months ago and now he has almost three thousand um just because i started retweeting him and it's like basically mm-hmm. the barrier for entry now is you need a bigger creator to signal boost you mm-hmm. um or you no one's gonna see you and i don't think that was true five ten years ago yeah, it really is a fascinating thing, especially nowadays. That's something that RB3 and I have actually been running into because we started on YouTube mm-hmm. and now we're with the publication Geeks of Color mm-hmm. where we actually write reviews and, and go out of our way to go to screenings and stuff like that. Uh, but it really is an interesting subject. Uh, uh, one thing that you guys share in common is we're, you're both USC graduates. I know RB3 had a, oh, no. <laughs> had a question about that as well. Yeah, no. Sorry, I, I was about to wear my UCLA shirt, the colors of the enemy. <laughs> 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 no, nah, um, yeah, I know, obviously, you're a USC graduate. I actually didn't want to ask this, kind of a side <laughs> question, but I think you might have tweeted one time you went to, you were like in the same class as like Ryan Coogler. He um, was a semester ahead of me. So oh, wow. he was, yeah, so I did work on some of his student films uh, oh. as like, you know, a first, uh, sec- yeah, a second semester, because he, you know, obviously was one of those people that like accelerated incredibly quickly. So I think by his, were you in the MFA or? Um, B- I, was a, I was an undergraduate, yes. B- yeah, so he, 
uh, you know how the, hmm, I forget what the number equivalent is, but like the, um, so we have 507, which is the equivalent of 290. Yes. And 508, which is the equivalent of- 291. 291. Yes. And then you have the advanced projects. And so, uh, and obviously the, the master's program is a lot more accelerated. So like he was doing the advanced project. He was directing an advanced project in his fourth semester, which mm -hmm. was my third semester. Uh, so yeah, that, that was like the one time I actually worked with him. So that, that's my, my, Robert, my Ryan Coogler name drop. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have not seen him in 10 years. <laughs> not, he is not on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he's a busy dude. But you know, we, we just did an episode of our podcast uh, talking about film school and its importance. Mm -hmm. So a as a USC graduate, like what's what's your stance on um, on film school? Well, um, I just, I'm, that's honestly why I'm pissed at USC right now because they're charging film students the same tuition. Yeah. Uh, and like, especially like the master's students, because it's like, at least in the, in the bachelor's program, you're getting other stuff. Like you, you, you have to study like, you know, your language requirement and math and English and stuff. But like in the master's program, it's like a conservatory. There's nothing else. So like for them to charge full price for something that you need like the whole reason you go to USC is for the hands-on physical like they physically force you to like be on set and like do all these things that you can't learn like just by making YouTube videos in your room and mm. uh like I, I I think it is different to like go online for USC film than it would be for like you know accounting or you know English right. or whatever I do think that's super unethical um yeah. But like, I also think like people who haven't gone, I mean, obviously you went to USC film, you know how difficult it is, like for the way they kind of set you up to work in the industry where it'll be like, you know, you have to work with the guilds and you have to like set up casting calls and you have to like do sides and you have to learn every single step, whether or not you plan on going into like cinematography or editing or whatever, you have to at least learn all of the steps. And uh, I think until you go through it, it's like, you know, yeah, you can go outside of the school route, um, but it, it, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> It's, it's really difficult like uh, to, to, to explain what you get from a, a, a school like USC and obviously not all film schools are the same um, but like also what also like Hank Green uh, just put up a video about like the sort of cost benefit of higher education in general mm. really being called into question now because uh, when did you graduate? I, I literally just graduated a year ago. Oh really? Ago. Yes. Yeah because it, it's just the the cost now like every single year is just 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 it is kind of because i don't like the idea of putting like a dollar sign like my education uh costs this much so i have to make this much in the first you know x years of my career or it wasn't worth it like i hate that i hate that right. transactional like approach to education but on the other hand it is like it, it is genuinely becoming like unsustainable like who is like no one can pay this back i have sixty thousand dollars of student debt yeah. from yes. 10 years ago <laughs> yeah yep. yeah and it's and it's you know it's really sad and you know like you said they're not only charging full tuition they're actually increasing tuition three percent mm -hmm. uh this semester and uh, my buddy kate Hughesby, who i am co-directing my next short film with he's uh a senior in the undergraduate program so he did all of his like um general education classes he's going specifically for film and what they're having him do is that he's doing all of his classes online, except for one. He has one hybrid class. And I think they just throw the hybrid class in there just to get people to show up and like live on campus or whatever. So, yeah, it's a really it's a really and the hybrid class only meets one one day a week for like two hours outside. And it's a cinematography class. So it's, it's really uh, it's really weird. I don't know what their deal is, but I, I definitely do agree, though. There is like a. Uh, the usefulness of like the skills that you that you use, but mm -hmm. the cost benefit is definitely a lot. So yeah, and I think a lot of the usefulness is you know at the activity of the process. You know, it's you can because people all the time ask me like like what what is a book I can read about like screenwriting or whatever, and I'm like. Eh. I didn't find any of them particularly helpful. The stuff I found helpful was you know actually going to lectures taking notes on the lectures and applying those notes to your own writing um like you can read david mamet or you know save the cat or stephen king and i, I remember like some tidbits from those but those weren't actually what teach you how to do it like being in the room like especially in screenwriting classes that actually kind of function like a writer's room sometimes that is a useful thing and you can bring that online eh, but like it, it it you definitely lose something in the transition 
Yeah, and, and obviously kind of going along those lines, our, our co-host who couldn't be here today, she was, uh, she was sick, is also a, an aspiring screenwriter who joins us on our channel and our reviews. Mm. Uh, our RB3 had a question from her as well. Yeah, um, yeah. She, uh, our, our co-host Sabrina, she's a writer and she's a growing personality in, in the YouTube space. I mean, she just joined our channel about a year ago um, and she's just getting kind of fresh into it. So I guess it's kind of like a two-point question. Uh, like for one, like what kind of challenges did you see um, being a, uh, a a woman in this space, a, a, a female personality in the movie YouTube criticism space? What mm-hmm. kind of challenges did you face? And also, what would you say for someone who wants to make that transition from being a personality to an author? Um, well, I guess it's the other question is kind of difficult because uh, it it's not really a tried and true path. Uh, mm-hmm. we're, kind of, we're a little bit in uncharted territory here because most YouTubers who write books, write nonfiction, they'll write like some extension of right. like, you know, like Instagram where it'll be like an Instagram star gets a book deal and it's just their Instagram blog or, mm-hmm. um, so it usually when YouTubers write fiction, it'll be like usually ghostwritten and usually mm-hmm. YA. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like there, and, or you have like the, the rare unicorn of John Green, who was famous as an author before he became a YouTuber. Mm-hmm. And then you have his brother, Hank, who just became an author. So it's, you know, it's kind of like a weird family thing. So uh, it, it is, it is kind of a strange, like, um, yeah, uncharted territory almost, uh, you know, as for film, like, you know, the, 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 my, my dark, my tragic backstory is I, I kind of low key got me toed out of the industry or well, like re- reverse me too. What's the, <laughs> I got harassed out of the industry. <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> By, uh, well, okay, you can't really get harassed out of an industry. You can have something happen to you and decide it's not worth your while. And that was my experience with, uh, specifically with post-production. Um, mm. I'm not gonna name names, cause I think, you know, this guy's like 80 something years old if he's not dead. Um, but like, it was a director of a documentary I was working for. Um, sexually harassed me right in front of the producers and then like oh played God. it off as a joke. Wow. And um, then I, I was like so horrified, I just ran outside the building and then the, the female producer ran after me and started talking about like, this is just a thing, this is just, you know, like I've, I've had inappropriate touching at award shows and blah, 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 mm. blah. I like basically tried to pass it off like it was normal. And so that was when I decided to work YouTube full time. <laughs> you know? yeah. Like, yeah. I, you know, it's just kind of it eventually kind of came to a point where I was like, I have to choose to focus on one or the other. Um, and that was sort of the precipitating moment where I was just like, this just isn't worth it. You know, maybe I'm getting constantly harangued and disrespected online, but at least I'm not beholden to someone else, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that that was around 2015. Um, so that, that was when I decided to kind of start, started focusing on YouTube full time. So that's also kind of, I guess when you could kind of see like there, there was a shift in quality around my channel. That was when I shifted to my current channel. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, I don't know. I think like, I, I don't, and obviously that's not a rare occurrence at all. That was, and I think it, it is kind of an individual's choice, like whether it's worth it to them to stay in a position where people in power might take advantage of you. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I think the problem with the Me Too mu- movement is it is extremely flawed and it does, you know, right now it's kind of turning into like this weird vigilante thing more than a means of creating accountability. Um, so, you know, cause like think of, look at how much it took to bring Brian Singer down. Yeah. Speaking of USC alums, like oh, he has Lord. been a known sex pest for 20 years. And like, <laughs> like look at how hard it, we had to go. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah. And, and, but as I think it's like, it is becoming a lot m- more friendly for women. Like five years ago, it was uh, at least on YouTube. Uh, cause uh, in the film space, you're always kind of at a disadvantage uh, algorithmically if you're basically anything but a straight white man <laughs> um, because you know YouTube's algorithm is racist and sexist because people are racist and sexist and so like if you know for instance a white person sees a, a thumbnail with a black person like pointing to a star war they're gonna be like mm, that person's not talking to me they're talking to their people and so they're less likely to click on it therefore the algorithm is less likely to recommend it and you know the same applies across like gender lines and um, all sorts of fun things. Um, but I it has it has definitely uh, gotten better. I've noticed there there's definitely like um a growing uh, number of 
the female film commentators like Jenny Nicholson and mm -hmm. like then you even have like old school well not film but like YouTubers like old school YouTubers like Cat Black um uh has had her channel like double in size over the last few months so I think you know I, I don't I don't think the algorithm is getting less racist I think maybe people are <laughs> becoming more interested in marginalized voices so that's yes. good so it's not as bad as it used to be is the very very long answer to that question <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that that's great. And obviously, it, you had this amazing opportunity to to bring forth this book that you were already working on for, I, I believe you said, mm -hmm. over 10 years. Um, well, I guess I was like, off and on, I like, I think that I wrote the first draft seven years ago. And I was, yeah, it's funny, speaking of Ben Shapiro, like the one of the characters in the first draft, his name was uh, Saul Kaplan, his name was Shapiro in the first draft. No. <laughs> <laughs> Guess yep. why I changed it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, like I think I came up with the concept like ten years ago, and then um, actually started pecking at it seven years ago, and then just kind of worked on it off and on over the next five years, and then sold it in the beginning of twenty nineteen. Yeah, and it's amazing. And obviously, like I just said, I read it a couple of days ago. An incredible read and, and an incredible debut novel. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, but but I want to I want to ask about Cora because obviously mm -hmm. she's the protagonist of the story, uh, and she starts the story out with uh, we found out like later on in the first chapter that she has this kind of weight on her, glooming over her, and that's her father, uh, and that's a a, a a a a story that a lot of people can kind of go to as far as her character. Um, so I want to ask about how was it coming up with her as the protagonist of the story, first of all, and second of all, just because, I mean, RB3 and I are geeks of color, and I know it might not be important to some people, but it actually kind of was to me reading the book, just being a Latino, mm -hmm. seeing her be Latina and having that name Ortega, mm -hmm. uh, really- <laughs> But also kind of rejecting it. <laughs> yeah, it's true. But yeah. at the same time I read it and I was like, mm -hmm. oh, she's Latina. Like it, uh -huh. it, it actually meant something to me. Uh, so how was that, that whole idea of coming up with her as a character? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You're actually the first person to ask me about that aspect. Like, I've seen a couple people tweet about it. Like, is she Latina? And I'm just like, yeah. Uh, uh, and then she's like, well, she describes herself as white. And she's like, well, yeah. Like, <laughs> you, yeah. You can, it can be, por, por que no los dos? It, you can be both. Especially if you're, like, in her case, kind of, because, like, her, she's, you know, Latina on her father's side and uh, Italian on her mother's side. Uh, but her father's side also kind of has this complicated, um, you know, heritage because uh she her dad is also a german citizen because his he is german so mm -hmm. uh you know there there's a lot of muddling in there that i mean it, i think it's because I, I don't like to you know talk about my ancestry because people get weird about it but i, I think in my case it, it she has a lot of ambivalence about it because she kind of you know i think doesn't really feel like she's quite in the club um mm. it's because of you know her her dad being half german um and uh like i i think a, lo a lot of people feel that way too where it's just like yeah technically you're of a group but maybe for whatever reason like it's a bit maybe it's a distant ancestry or you don't have like a personal connection to the culture in a way that a lot of your peers do you can you kind of feel detached and i think like sure. that also kind of is you know it serves as like a um like even more of that detachment where it's like, you know, she has a, a Spanish speaking, you know, grandmother uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, she has this really estranged relationship with. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think it, in a, in a way it kind of speaks to a lot of that estrangement, but also like the fact that like m most all of the human characters in the book are like, s some have some relationship to diaspora. Um, mm -hmm. Like, uh, and uh, like, and that's all kind of very subtext. And I get that was also kind of by design, uh, which we may or may not get into more in second. Well, actually it's much more text in the second book, uh, like the, this, uh, you know, question of diaspora, because I like, um, you know, I, th I think in this, not all first contact novels, but some first contact novels kind of touch on topics like that. Obviously, so if there are aliens involved, you can easily tiptoe into diaspora. So um, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that, that, that was, definitely intended to be some subtext and you know reflect a sort of you know conflicted relationship that i think a lot of people feel right now to their own uh cultural background so that's something you kept in uh kept in mind when you came up with the character was the idea mm -hmm. of her background and of her culture mm -hmm. uh, that's great that's amazing uh i know rb3 had a question about the audiobook because he listened to the audiobook yeah i actually listened to the audiobook and i do want to say when you're talking about the diaspora and the, mm -hmm. the cultural relevance I, i'm actually from 
um, Compton, California. I, I'm living here now, and you know, I went to high school in Carson, which is in the South Bay. Mm-hmm. So the yeah. fact that this is I'm in, in Long Beach. Yeah, like, hey, there yeah. you go. See, <laughs> see, it's uh, and, and the fact that he said it in in California in the South Bay area is very close to home for me. And I feel like that's a real dynamic that a lot of people deal with. Um, but yeah, I, I want to go to uh, uh, try, kind of shift a little bit. Um, in a, a number of your videos, you, you talk a lot about the idea of medium specificity and how mm-hmm. important it is for um, uh, for uh, to embrace the medium and whichever like the art form that the story is being told in. So like when you wrote this book, how much did you think about that necessarily? Um, because I know for me as an audiobook listener, it was a little <laughs> bit of a different experience listening to audio book as it was like, um, Andres reading it like uh, on, on, uh, on the book, book wise. Yeah. Cause I don't have any control over like the, I mean, I, I give them, uh, basically the only say I had in that was, um, T- telling Ollie who did the interstitials uh, to do it in an American accent <laughs> mm-hmm. and to uh, act Nils in a certain way, Nils mm-hmm. being Cora's father. And so most mm-hmm. of, so, cause it's, it's constructed a little incon- unconventionally because like, despite the fact that Nils is such a big presence in the book, he's never actually, he never actually interacts with the narrative. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He, he exists mostly in these like interstitials. So I basically had an actor play his part. Um, and so I could talk to him about, um, you know, what, you know, him being a so- sort of like a showman. He's not like a Ben Shapiro type. He's more like a, um, like, I don't know. I mean, I don't think Julian Assange is very charismatic. So (laughs) like I think more almost kind of like a, um, I don't know, like imagine if Tom Hiddleston played Julian Assange or something. (laughs) Uh, So, uh, but other than that, you don't get a lot of say in it. So I like, sometimes I'll listen to the, like the audio book and be like, wow, that wasn't the tone I had in mind. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) But um yeah, I, I definitely didn't. I think the only thing I wrote with the audiobook in mind was the interstitials because I thought uh, that mm. was, um, you know, that that opened up for a lot, a, you know, a lot more fun. And I think more the second one and the third one because that one is hopefully going to have more actors in it because it has more than one point of view character. First book only has one point of view character. Um, and uh, but I, I think it's 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 a little, you know, that's that's how adaptation works is. Mm there's always this marriage and interchange between mediums Mm -hmm. um because i think in this case a a lot of reasons you don't see books like this is um they tend to stories like this tend to be more in movies right and Mm -hmm. so it's and it's obviously movies that influenced the story more than anything and so then translating that into like prose i think is a challenge and maybe not one i always rose to uh but it was also kind of you know because it was so inspired by movies was deliberately wrote like in a sort of cinematic style and Mm. constructed like with a very three act screenplay style and um you know without almost like was sort of adaptation in mind uh because that was you know sort of the the bones of it was so influenced by film yeah i mean that was literally just going to be my exact next question like have you thought about a film adaptation and have you thought about maybe like a filmmaker or a team that you kind of want behind a, a story like this um no, and yeah, you don't really get to choose that sort of thing. Right. Um, y- you, the, I guess the thing where we're at right now, because obviously like the world has stopped, so it's kind of mm-hmm. irrelevant. Um, it is basically like I did, I, I told the, the film rights people, because we do have a film rights agent, basically I was like, it's TV or nothing. I'm not doing film. Like that's not even mm-hmm. on the table. Um, and, uh, and, and basically like all these other writers that make me one of those like difficult authors that, <laughs> <laughs> that just like you know basically i have to be x level of involvement although it is because i did um but several of the characters in the book are, are named after um people i went to film school with um <laughs> and uh one of them uh he is actually a pretty successful <laughs> producer he works with he worked with ryan coogler uh, i think with fruitvale station and um uh a couple of other things and he he's like already kind of started he's like hey people have been like hitting me up about film rights uh <laughs> This is weird. <laughs> yeah, this, is, yeah. this is really weird. <laughs> so you would prefer a, a TV adaptation over a movie adaptation? Is kind of uh, mm-hmm. what you mean? Is that is that mainly because of studio involvement or I mean, meddling or? A TV is TV is where originality lives right now. Yes, um, movies are like either extreme extreme indies or massive tent poles. There isn't really an in between anymore. 
Um, and if there is, it's usually made by like an auteur or someone like, you know, Guillermo del Toro, who has mm. like the resources to make something original. Um, mm. But like more and more TV is just kind of where the prestige lives. People want yeah. to work in television. Um, I think that's only good, going to become more and more true because like, you know, that was where the, the ship was headed. But with COVID, it has really, really accelerated that. Um, but also just because like the, the structure of it, I think it would just be so clumsy in two hours. Like mm -hmm. it just because it, I feel like it, it's one of these narratives that would lend itself to adaptation in a way that like shows everything that happens off screen. Like because um, there's a lot that happens off screen um, that, you know, in an adaptation, you probably would want on screen. So I feel, I feel like it, 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 so it would need to be something longer to kind of allow it to live up to its full potential. So that, that was why I was like, it's, you know, gotta be TV and it's gotta be one of those 10 episode deals. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I am <laughs> in no series. hurry. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, five seasons. There you go. Five seasons. There you go. See, <laughs> well, it's five I books. Did... Yeah. yeah, you gotta put um, it out there. Yeah. Uh, my next question is is me getting a little nerdy uh, just because I, mm -hmm. I want to and I need to. Uh, and that's the language aspect of this book, uh, mm -hmm. which is very heavy throughout. It's almost a, a through line throughout the entire book is the importance of language and how uh, the Fremda group, basically everyone there was just literally just trying to figure out what they were saying the entire time. Uh, and then up here comes Ampersand. Uh, and he basically translates everything that's been going on this whole time. Mm -hmm. uh, but the idea of language and linguistics and how expansive it could be in humanity and how limited it could be uh, in the grand scope of things when it comes to the universe, what was your, your study in this and what was your idea behind incorporating the theme of language throughout the book? Uh, I think it was rooted largely in my undergrad, I studied, uh, I didn't have a linguistics minor. I had a concentration, which is Ooh. like two classes short of a minor. Okay. Uh, but like, I, I, you know, that was always kind of like knocking around in my head. And like, mm -hmm. I guess if, if, cause I, I think someone actually on Twitter today noted that like the Sapir Whorf hypothesis is a really, um, mm. popular go-to in science fiction. That was the thing that kind of influenced arrival and story of your life. And mm -hmm. basically the, um, the idea behind that is, uh, how do you describe it? Uh, that, the, that the language you speak actually affects your cognition and it affects the way that you think and the way that you perceive reality. And so I kind of went in the complete other direction. Like I went in the, the Noam Chomsky, like, which is much more utilitarian. And uh, that was sort of where the idea of like lang human language as an algorithm came from uh, because uh, Chomsky's ideas on language are basically like, all human languages carry like certain, like all of the same certain traits, which almost you can look at them like a puzzle that can be solved. Um, and so that, that was sort of, and, but then there's also the question of like narrative utility where it's just like, you can have a story like Arrival where um, the entire story is uh, about the process of learning the language. Uh, and if that's the story you want to write, great but that wasn't really the story I wanted to write because <laughs> I, um, I was like, so that was why it's like, okay, so we have this language barrier, but then here comes this other character who's like, we figured it out off screen a while ago. <laughs> Cause uh, you know, we got, we got to keep this, you got to keep the narrative yes. going. Yeah. So let's, let's go explain the things instead of making the story about the act of like, you know, learning the language. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause it just wasn't that type of story. It wasn't a how, it wasn't a decode the language story. It was a decode the mystery, basically. It was like almost kind of like a murder mystery. Um, so yeah, it, it depends on what story you want to write. So it's like, I wanted to write a story that talked a lot about language while not actually being like a, you know, a, you know, hold up a picture of a cat, say cat, you know, <laughs> yeah. so on. Um, yeah. RB3, you had a question about the setting, right? Well, yeah, I was going to say, you know, you're speaking on, on, Chomsky, on Chomsky and how much it, you know, influenced like the ideas and perception of language. He's also a very political mm -hmm. guy as well. And this movie is set in the early 2000s. And, um, you know, I love that it's set in the early 2000s because that's like during the Bush administration that was mm -hmm. like notorious for lying to the public and, uh, and, you know, making all these wild justifications for infringing on our privacy. Was that was that kind of the idea uh, mm -hmm. of setting like this first contact of, of alien species during a yeah. time where people were particularly distrustful? Yeah, because fundamentally it is a story about uh, uh, when to tell the truth <laughs> 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 on a personal level, but also on a you know 
global level, which mm -hmm. is why, you know, it kind of starts with this idea of like Nils Ortega, who's a, um, you know, very thinly veiled Julian Assange. <laughs> Yep. Type, um, and you know his his very hardline stance that like you know all of America's ills are rooted in the fact that the government has just become such a lying lying ball of lies over the you know ever since nine eleven. So um, and, and then there being a sort of question of like, well, is that true? Yes, but uh, <clears throat> you know it's obviously like, well, what is the solution? <laughs> you know, it's it's like a really complicated question, and he has a very simplistic answer to it. Um, so uh, I, I feel like it, it was also sort of this weird time, like right before uh, like Snowden, the Snowden leaks mm -hmm. and Manning leaks and everything, um, where, you know, it was just everybody was sort of willfully head in the sand at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was just sort of like it, whenever the big revelation happened, it was, of course, going to be huge, um, especially like the Patriot Act, which even at the time, I remember like when the Snowden leaks happened, I, I was surprised that everyone else was surprised because mm -hmm. I was in high school when the Patriot Act passed and I remember like talking about it in, in class and like, okay, well, what, are, what is this provision? What does this law actually do? And so like technically everything that Snowden revealed was legal mm -hmm. in the same way that like, you know, the Iraq war was legal and all these like hideously unethical things are technically legal. Um, so uh, yeah, but at the same time, like the story just would not make sense now at all mm -hmm. uh and I, I feel like part of that is like people would uh, i've seen a lot of people be like i don't because there's a thing that happens about halfway through the book <laughs> mm -hmm. regarding president bush um mm -hmm. that uh so people were like well, i think that's not realistic uh and i was like i feel like that is very telling that uh in the context of the book like this huge scandal which in real life would be just like you know world changing that the way the government reacts to it, they find unrealistic because nothing matters anymore. <laughs> right, right, because of 2020, like, exactly. It's a new day, new scandal, whatever, aliens, sure, fine, whatever. Like, it, it's just, it, I think that the world has changed so much that like this thing that you, that happens in the book, people found kind of unrealistic. And uh, like, obviously, like, I can't say that like you're wrong because it's fiction, but like, uh, yeah, it, it, it's interesting that, you know, whether or not people find that particular plot point realistic or not. Yeah, and speaking of, of going along those lines without actually spoiling anything or, or me attempting to not spoil anything, there was a moment in the book, uh, I'll say a Cheney moment uh, <laughs> that literally made me scream out loud. I screamed out loud and I was like, this might be uh, even worse. <laughs> yeah, oh, you're gonna love the second book. <laughs> oh, there we go, yeah. there we go. Yeah, because I- it's, it's really weird, like, yeah, I, I think that's another fun thing where I'm just like allowing myself to write in historical figures, like people yep. who really existed. So Cheney is in the second book, like quite a lot. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. you know what, fuck it, fine, this is fine. <laughs> funny yeah and I, I can't lie it was very funny and I, and I could <laughs> like literally scream out loud so uh that's amazing but um my follow-up is kind of going back to my little language nerdy nerdy verse mm -hmm. uh just uh, talk to me about the idea of making core the interpreter of ampersand and, and the idea of having this enormous weight on her as far as like being the literal uh you know decoder between first contact of humanity and I also like the fact that she omits words and omits phrases and makes it a little bit more palatable depending on who she's speaking to. Uh, talk to me about the idea of that being her role throughout the book. Right, well, like, I guess the, um, sort of the tagline, because every book needs a tagline, the tagline of the book is truth is a human right, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, and people would ask me like, is that true? And I'm like, um, I don't know. It's true for the guy who says it. Uh, mm. And that's part of the reason why it is the tagline, because, um, you know, Nils is a showman. He's, he's good at marketing himself, and that's why people find him compelling. But my attitude is that the truth, what is actually true, is not as important as how the truth is framed. And I think that is sort of what was more interesting to me about, what was more interesting to me than the literal cracking the code of language was how the words are framed and how the intent is framed. It's Cause um, basically Ampersand shows up and you know, he has his like list of demands and then he will say like, okay, well you need to, you know, if, if you're going to be my interpreter, then you need to speak for me, but you need to do it in a way that isn't going to, you know, make the situation worse. You need mm -hmm. to be, you, your function needs to be a de-escalating, you know, 
thing. And uh, that I, you know, basically being part of, um, you know, the whole dynamic and the whole conflict of the book is her as the intermediary, you know, trying to convey his intent uh, truthfully, but also doing it in such a way, knowing that the people that she is doing the interpreting to are assuming the worst and are probably assuming bad faith and are, you know, constantly looking for threats and not unjustifiably so, you know, and that is a very American way of, of doing business, you know, for better or worse, is just this assumption that like, we can't trust anything, therefore we have to dominate everything. And so basically her function in the book is like not a translator, but a like sort of message mediator mm -hmm. uh and therefore like a big part of her job is to decide what to omit and what to not omit like if he says something creepy she's gonna be like okay we can't <laughs> all right we, we're not going to talk about your live human experimentation today they probably won't like that um <laughs> yeah <laughs> let's just omit that yeah and it really does paint an interesting picture on interpreters obviously in the real world my, my dad was previously an interpreter uh, for the government and for court translations, because there's a lot of Latinos that go through court. Uh, they need an interpreter there pretty much 24-7. Uh, my dad did that for a living for quite a while, so there is a, a, there is an importance to it. There's like this weight to it uh, when there is a, a decision being made on someone's life and you're uh, the one who's supposed to represent them. Was there any kind of research behind uh, the, the concept of interpreting versus the concept of translating? Uh, not really, because okay. in this case, it's just like, she's just a complete amateur and does not know what yeah. she's doing like is it just making it up on the fly so that sort of stuff doesn't really feel relevant like basically and part of the reason why i, I like gave her like a very low-key education was that whenever um like certain terms were used like you know phonetics versus phonemics and stuff like that like she'd know what they meant um mm -hmm. and that basically being as far as her expertise gets uh but you know really it's it's less like in her case it's less a story of like you know qualification and skill so much as like instinct and sure. uh being uh able to you know Im improvise you know for her own survival but also for ours i guess <laughs> yeah and i love that i love that she's like she's 21 right so she's mm -hmm. young mm -hmm. and she's a college dropout two years in but she has that base knowledge of what she needs to know to get by it's very realistic in that way where it's not like the super computer girl mm -hmm. who's like the super tech wizard uh she's actually like very grounded in that way so i, I really did enjoy that as well uh rb3 you had a yeah. question about the design for the uh for the alien spe uh, species uh yeah i, I did have a design uh I, mm -hmm. sorry question the design. <laughs> i have a question uh, how'd you come up with the design for the alien species like the culture of the mm -hmm. super organisms and the, and the hierarchy like what was kind of your inspiration for that uh, well, i guess there's always gonna be some like informing yes. of other tropes you know like uh, so I found that I was honestly kind of working against, you know, alien conventions. Like, mm. I, that was why I had to write in several times, like, no, we can't read minds. <laughs> That's not a skill that is in our yeah. Rolodex because, um, like, whenever she, you know, she'd talk about, like, this, you know, like, the different types of language and how one of them is, you know, telepathy-ish, but mm -hmm. only in the way that, like, texting is telepathy. You know, it's just, like, it's, it's basically just, like, talking through, you know, cell, like, you know, like basically like a thought powered cell network. It's not really telepathy. Um, and that being confusing and yeah, and uh, also like just this, the use of the word superorganism, people be like, oh, hive mind. And like, no, <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> like, so it's interesting, like as a writer in this genre, having to like work against people's expectations. But that said, I definitely still use certain, um, you know, tropes of the genre like you know sort of like this idea of like you know, sort of an unconventional take on pair bonding for instance mm, um right. and like the sort of complex complexity of the caste system but basically the way i approached it was like since i wanted them to be alive like not machines but like you know living things that had kind of melded with machines um i uh i, I basically kind of constructed an evolutionary history that was like 
you had a lot of the same similarities, you know, it's got to be a social species or they wouldn't have developed language, um, you know, it's got to has, have certain traits in common, like dexterous hands and um, uh, like, you know, certain social groups and as a way of constructing hierarchy. Um, and then basically kind of extrapolated from that, like built a timeline based on like this, you know, different evolutionary history that has like traits in common with humans, but also in common with like other animals that we know, like albatrosses and gorillas and um, imagining a sort of like evolutionary history for this hypothetical species that like has other things in common with us, like being bipedal and like, you know, having to, you know, cause it's like the thing about alien life is it could go all sorts of, like <laughs> all sorts of random directions that you don't know. Um, but there is a very compelling argument to be made that like, uh, advanced aliens would probably be, be bipedal and they would probably have two eyes and you know stuff like that where it's like um just by nature of like what is the most efficient way to accomplish what we have accomplished um right. so uh but i also there's also sort of like the sort of narrative um function of well what what are they saying by the design by like the literal design like mm. because if you watch a movie the design of any fantasy creature is telling is shorthand for something right mm -hmm. like um like i think district nine is a really good example of like these you know aliens that are kind of like gross and inhuman looking but like their eyes are very expressive mm -hmm. so it's not difficult to see them as characters and um you know same with like uh like i think the transformers movies are really bad about this <laughs> they're very lazy but bumblebee is great like Bum bumblebee is like d does it does it really well like that 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 design is great and accomplishes like this sort of like dichotomy between like this cute friendly thing and this you know scary killing machine yes. um so that that was sort of what I, what I was going for was i wanted something that was sort of like you know scary in the way that like geiger's xenomorph is scary but also kind of beautiful like in the way that a tiger is beautiful like um and, I, and also like I, I i like spiders like that's why i kept bringing oh, spiders really? in like yeah. i just i just like looking at them like i mm. we i we actually have a bunch i have yeah i have a my husband has like about 20 30 pet spiders um <laughs> actually dozens now because we just had a we just had an egg sack hatch uh, oh, man. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. yeah so they got some spiderlings um but yeah so uh, i i guess that's also just like you what you you bring your own bullshit to your you know design yeah. so yeah. like I, I i i like uh you know i like the look of dragons and i like the look of spiders mm. so that was so mm. that also informed it a lot uh yeah. sorry i've thought about this a lot yeah. sorry for the very long-winded answer no yeah. of course not. i mean I, every time i've read uh spider-like fingers around her i was like oh no <laughs> yeah yeah that's yeah. that's the ultimate scary image you could get yeah you could at least for like, me yeah yeah yeah, yeah. No, I mean, yeah it's like, that's like, like and that's funny because like a lot of the fan art i've seen is yeah. like way cuter than Ooh. I <laughs> like yeah. you know I imagined uh, yeah. like a little Pokemon-ish and because I'm like I guess the thing I had in my head was a lot um like like yes interesting to look at but not something you want to be in the same room with sure. at least not right away um right. and yeah. uh yeah, so I, I I gotta I gotta like get a witness sketch or something like find someone who can do art to oh, actually help me. That'd yeah. be funny. Well, you know, <laughs> I, it, we talk about design. You know, obviously it's very like, um, I, you obviously talk. You know, the the book is very influenced, not influenced necessarily, but you know, the the idea of language is a is a carryover from like Arrival, which mm -hmm. also had like its own like distinct character design. Now, I also one of my favorite alien movies is Contact, right? Mm -hmm. Which is. Um, kind of forgoes the alien design and totally and just makes yeah, it Jodie Foster's father. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, I guess I guess I kind of transition to my next question. One of the elements that I really, well, I guess Andres will probably ask this next question, but one of the elements I really enjoyed about Contact was the um, idea of like these aliens coming to Earth and not necessarily having like the most positive perception oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of, 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 of human life just because of the history. I know Andres had a question uh, like about that. Well, I love the, the title of part two, uh, because my first thought reading that, especially oh, yeah. after the <laughs> end of flesh eating aliens. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I was, uh, I was trying not to say, it, but yes, oh. billions of flesh eating aliens. <laughs> I guess you, you can cut that unless we're live. Are we live or not? No, no, no we're not. <laughs> we're not. <laughs> we're not. <laughs> no. Well, I, I love that title because when mm -hmm. you finish part one, your immediate assumption is like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> like, cause at the end of part one, we, we see what happens to Korra. So, mm -hmm. so when I read that, I was like, oh, Ampersand is afraid of humanity. Uh, and the idea of, of humanity just normalizing eating flesh in general is just another fascinating 
uh, entire other subject. Mm -hmm. um, but where did you come up with that concept of aliens viewing us in this kind of <laughs> pessimistic angle? Honestly, it came from a joke post on Tumblr no uh, where uh, some people were like, you know, wouldn't it be funny, you know, because like we have all these like, you know, it's narratives about how like the aliens are the scary ones and we're the weak ones, but wouldn't it be funny if like we were like the, the you know, giant roided cockroaches of the universe and they mm. show up and they're like, oh my God, they eat capsaicin? They hurt themselves on, on purpose? They drink poison because it's fun? Like, <laughs> you know, like there's all sorts of things that, you know, humans do that like, it, if you frame it a certain way, that's like, and to say nothing of the fact that like, we are at the top of the food chain and mm. we do le eat literally everything. And, you know, I think it, it especially like, cause basically it kind of came down to, again, that evolutionary history where like the uh, amygdalins are um, descended from like herbivores in like the same way that a gorilla is. So mm -hmm. like, they just kind of go through their evolutionary history, assuming that's the normal thing. And then to like come across an advancing civilization where like we, like literal cockroaches will eat anything. Like, is wow that's horrifying like yes. you know depending on what your background is and so that was that was sort of the fun thing about like because like the rewrite uh because like the first version of this story didn't have that and then when i rewrote it uh i tried to put in as much of that as possible because i liked this idea of like ampersand coming in with biases that were mm. wrong some of the time but mm. not all of the time like mm -hmm. you know that's for instance the uh you know the extrapolating like oh you eat flesh means you're gonna bite as a <laughs> as, as like yeah. a defense mechanism like okay yeah i guess we do eat meat but that's i doesn't mean i want to eat you yeah we just don't think like that like that would that wasn't even on the table so to speak so uh yeah that, that was sort of a fun thing thinking about like what are the ways that uh outside eyes looking in could see us as just like fundamentally horrifying on a conceptual level if not actively threatening on a practical level at least not yet yeah yeah right. and, and i love that aspect of it being centered around an in and out burger as well <laughs> uh i just thought that was hysterical uh i, I kind of want to finish up on obviously the idea behind inspiration uh I believe you're a Transformers fan. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really did feel the Transformers <laughs> in this book. And I'm saying that as a good thing, by the way, uh, especially around the character of Obelis. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm assuming I'm pronouncing it Obelis, correct. Obelis, yeah. Obelis, uh, where every time Obelis showed up, I imagined Megatron. I don't know if that's correct or not, but that's kind of what I It's funny, imagined. yeah, I've heard that a lot and no. Uh, okay. Yeah, no, I, he's a little, I guess that, that'll become clearer in future books, but. Um, Got it. Uh, although I guess it depends on the Megatron. Um, when you said Cadillac, that's why I was like, oh, it's like Megatron. Right. He's like this crazy yeah, looking. Yeah, because he, um, like when I first conceived it, uh, was before the More Than Meets the Eyes books came out. And mm -hmm. that was, you know, when Megatron got interesting, <laughs> yep. at least in the comics. Um, cause it's funny cause like, but then like, uh, that Megatron is, uh, the, um, you know, sort of like the regretful despot who wants to make right. Um, mm. And I, I guess like Obelis is, uh, I guess without getting into it, he's like mostly just a racist. Yeah. Uh, but I guess I guess Megatron was too. So yeah, and I, th I think I, yeah. I could I could see it. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't it wasn't deliberate, but um, yeah, it. it, it I, I could definitely see the overlap. <laughs> um, and again, uh, a shout out to your series. Uh, when I read that, <laughs> I ate the whole plate. Yeah. yeah. And when she emphasized the whole, <laughs> the whole plate, <laughs> when she, uh, Cora was eating the pancakes, I again, I lost it. I thought that was hysterical. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's one of my favorite series on YouTube, by the oh, way. Oh, thank that, you. That, that Transformers. And, and The Hobbit, I got to say, just to, I don't mean to jump in too much here, but The yeah. Hobbit uh, trilogy that you, you know, that you, you dug, dug in the documentaries is absolutely mind blowing to me uh, oh, thank you thank you so much we worked really hard on those i hope one day we get to travel again do more yeah stuff we're, like that we're all moving to new zealand uh, <laughs> i know i know he's like that spongebob meme of like squidward looking out the window and like <laughs> patrick and spongebob like running like we you know i'm just like that's me yeah. looking at new zealand exactly that's <laughs> what it is right now um, Lindsay Ellis, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, obviously, your party, uh, my, I guess my final thing mm -hmm. is like, this is gonna be, you said a five uh, parter? Mm -hmm. that's, that's incredible. And you already have them all just kind of lined yeah. up? Yeah, the second one, I'm in revisions now. Um, that is okay. set to be released next fall. 
uh, you know, publishing is very slow. Um, but yeah, we're, uh, I, I hope, I hope, I hope it doesn't piss too many people off. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah, it's just like, I, I, I feel like the second one is, uh, cause like the, at, at the end of the day, fundamentally the first one is very set up heavy. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I feel like the second one is, is, uh, I guess a lot more, a lot stronger and more interesting. Um, mm. but we shall see if, if readers do agree. It is very different. Like it's, uh, um, the tone and the like conflict is very different. So uh, I, I hope I hope it uh, is I hope it reads the way I want it to. <laughs> yeah, it's it really is fascinating because I, I love how it ended, uh, considering you know the whole ampersand mm -hmm. or stay kind of thing and, and the, the idea focus on consent. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I that's actually another thing that I really enjoyed about it too. Uh, but but also the idea of the description that obelisks had the the what if situation if he stayed mm -hmm. just painted this entire scenario where it kind of makes you think oh wait that is yeah. actually very logical yeah uh, yeah he's, he's got his you know he's a nice guy but he's got some authoritarian tendencies yep. so i guess yep. we'll see how that plays out there you go. <laughs> and that's what you gotta wait for for the sequel guys but if you guys want to see the first one uh why i mean read the first one uh axioms and is available in stores everywhere uh i highly recommend it rb3 uh went the audiobook way i've read off the hard copy uh any way you guys can find it uh it's available there uh lindsay ellis thank you so much once again we really do appreciate you Thank you thank so much. You. It was a lot of fun. And thank you guys for having me on. Absolutely. Thank Alrighty, guys. Uh, for the Meeting of Podcast, I'm Andres. We're peacing out. Peace out, guys. Bye.